to get up and talk to you all today. And I hope that um, everything, when we get finished, it maybe will be better. Of course, you're all probably doing real good. But Sister Bourne and I have been together, been married 62 years. And uh, that's gaining on a century. And we'll probably be married still if we live to have our 100th anniversary. I'll only be 120. But at the rate I'm going, I'll probably make it unless something changes. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy that I can say today that don't have a pain in my body. I, I don't have to worry about feeling bad. I wake up early, go to bed late, and uh, when I wake up, I'm looking for something to do because I, I stay busy. But you know, marriage is something that uh, if we work it right, uh, it can be the best thing that ever happened. And if we don't work it right, it can be absolute torment. But I, I want to talk to you about uh, some things. Let me, let me first read Mark 11 and 11 through 14. Mark 11 and verse 11. And, and Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple, and when he looked round about, upon all things and now the evening tide was come and he went out unto Bethany with the twelve and on the morrow when they were come from Bethany he was hungry and seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves he came if happily he might find anything thereon and when he came to it he found nothing but leaves for the time of figs was not yet and Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee henceforth forever. And his disciples heard it. I, I want to talk to you on the subject today. Was, was he talking to you? Was he talking to you? The Lord speaks to us in strange ways. Sometimes it's by things that happen on a job. Sometimes it's things that happens where our children are concerned, but he's always speaking to us. But uh, when Brother Sarton asked me to speak on this, this morning, I was trying to decide what would be the best thing to talk about. And uh, I, I really feel that God is talking to us. But I want to ask you, was he talking to you? Do you believe that God can still talk to you? He talks to us in strange ways. The scripture I read, Jesus, uh, he entered in Jerusalem, went to the temple and looked around and found some things that wasn't quite exactly right. So he looked at it and then he walked out and he said, I'm not going to take care of this today, but I'll take care of it tomorrow. But on his way to church the second day, the Bible says he was hungry. I, I hope that you folks come here today hungry to hear something that will keep you uh, from any dangers, any inconsistencies in living for God. And, and on the morrow, he came from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing a fig tree of Far off, having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. We have an, a responsibility to be prepared every day. Our preparation uh, will bring us in contact with a lot of things that we have to be cautious that we don't pick up on that we leave alone, and that on the other hand, we come on things that we need to pick up on and be a part of. And 
the Lord, the, the strange thing about the scripture that I read, that uh, the Lord talked to this fig tree. Uh, and Jesus answered and said unto it, apparently the fig tree talked to him. And since this is what the, uh, the whole course of this scripture reading is, uh, when he found nothing, uh, because it was not time for figs to be yet or wasn't supposed to be ripe yet. When they have the leaves, they have little figs. But he didn't even find a green one on there. And so we come to church, we live for God, and we come to church and we want something from God. But sometimes teachers... Uh, will read a scripture and get up and talk without preparation. And that would be the absolute worst thing that you could do. Also, marriage, uh, people don't want to pray or don't pray or they're so busy they can't find time to pray. But I, I wonder what the Lord found when he was talking to us this morning. Did we answer him? And if we answered him, how did we answer him? Well, Lord, let me just imagine what you said or what I said. Well, God, uh, I know I hadn't done my best, but you'll have to forgive me this time. But boy, the Lord had a, a strong answer for them that day when, when he spoke to the tree that had spoken to him. When the tree said, well, God, uh, you just have to excuse me. Uh, I was busy. Uh, I had to go to the mall a few minutes. Uh, you know how that is with the ladies. They tell you they're going to go to the mall for a few minutes. Well, it generally winds up um, 30 minutes, an hour and 30 minutes, two hours and 30 minutes. And then when they get home, they say, well, you know, there were some things I was looking at and I lost track of time. I wonder how long has it been since we lost track of time when we were making sure our marriage was okay. Uh, we, we become so busy that we, we neglect. Sister Bourne and I have been married 62 years and uh, someone asked me how long I'd had we been married? I said, well, we've been married 62 years. Well, how, how was those years? Well, we had about uh, 58 good years. Those first two years and a half, uh, there were some disagreements, and we had to adjust to each other. And so maybe there was some times that it wasn't quite so good. But we had to make uh, quick arrangements, and now... When we get in the car to go somewhere, the first thing we do before we put it down and drive is we have a little talk with the Lord. God, we're fixed to be on the road. This trip's about 800 miles. And uh, if you would put your guide in hand around us, we don't want to make a wrong turn. We don't want to uh, run into any problems. And we had just soon not to even come upon an accident. And by the way, God, if you could move all the cops, put them out there in uh, McDonald's or somewhere where they will be eating. Because sometimes uh, my foot gets a little heavy and I have to back off. And uh, so I, I, I try. I thank the Lord we have cruise control. And my wife says, watch your speed. And I back her down and push the button and uh, take my foot off the uh, gasoline because uh, I hit the cruise, not to cruise, but now I got that uh, automatic drive. And so I, I can just fold my hands and say, okay, here we go. And occasionally the light will light up and it will say, uh, please put your hands on the steering wheel. And I will say, yes, ma'am. I answer that lady just as kind as I can because I want her to respond when I get a little bit out of line. 
And I want God to respond to me when I get a little out of line. Uh, it's easy when things are going bad, and uh, occasionally it does, that it affects the way we respond. And uh, when that happens, we need to be in control of our lives, that we don't respond negatively. And then when that happens, it creates a problem. So when Jesus uh, looked for figs before he ever said anything, uh, he, he pulled the leaves back. And normally a fig tree, they produce the leaves uh, after the bud comes out. And then as it begins to grow, the leaves cover it. And so uh, every day that we are trying to do something for God, we've got to remember that the Lord knows exactly where we are. But you know, I tried to analyze this verse and I, I looked at it like this. Well, well, Lord, you knew there were no figs on that tree when you went to it. Now, why did you go to it? Sometimes the Lord knows we're not prepared for a service, but we come in, we, we run out of the office where we're working or the place where we're working, we get to the house, we run in, we take a bath, we get ready, and we're telling the kids, if we got kids at home, uh, come on now, we got to go. And then we come rushing in, sometimes late, we walk into the church and we say, God, bless me if you can. And, and sometimes God looks at us and says, what are you talking about? You hadn't talked to me all day. I, the, the Lord come walking through the garden in the cool of the day and he was looking for someone, his creation, because he wanted to talk to them. And when he walked through, uh, he would talk to them. But on one occasion, he come and they wasn't prepared. They realized they had made a mistake. And so they were hiding behind the things that people normally hide behind. Well, God, uh, you'll have to understand, I had a bad day at the office. Uh, I started the church, and this guy pulled out in front of me, and it made me so mad. I, I'm, I'm glad I got to church. Uh, I'll have to pray through about some things that I thought. Uh, of course, you've never had that. And uh, uh, if you don't have a car, uh, you have to wait for someone else to carry you there or get on a bus, and, and then the bus stops too many times. But when we, when we get here and we start talking to the Lord and we say, well, God, I'm, I'm going to do better tomorrow. But, you know, the Lord looks at us and he says, uh, no man eat fruit from thee henceforth forever. I don't want to ever hear God talk to me like that. To tell me, you will never have any influence over anybody. This is the end of the road for you. And the Bible says that the next day, the third day, they come walking back to the temple the same way that they had walked the two prior days. And the disciples took note of the tree. It had dried up was rattling in the ground. The root system had died. All the leaves had fallen off and there was nothing there but a dead tree. You don't want that in your life and I don't want that. And I try to tell people, you, you got to come in here worshiping the Lord. And first thing you need to do before you even get in the car is tell God, I'm on my way to church. God, I uh, I, I want to talk to you a little bit. But you should have already been talking to the Lord. Someone asked me, well, Brother Bourne, how, how long should you pray every day? It's not how long you pray. It's the fact that you pray. Uh, I don't pray six hours a day. This, this one guy, one day I said, uh, sir, are you praying? He said, oh, I pray six hours a day. Some days, eight hours. I said, Oh, wait, wait a minute. Um, something ain't adding up. Uh, you don't look right. You don't act right. Something's wrong. 
Well, I got this little problem, he said, and I have to pray a lot. Well, apparently he wasn't praying enough because he died young and he died of a vicious disease that he contacted through his neglect for God. But you know, if, if I'm going to do right, uh, I, I don't think I will ever get uh, that disease that I'm referring to uh, unless it's by accident. But you know, when, when someone allows themselves to go in the wrong direction and then all of a sudden they realize, hey, I'm, I'm going to die, then they want to talk to God and they want to be, be real prayerful. But my suggestion to you is you pray when you get up in the morning before you get in your car and after you get in your car, then you ask God, God, I'm fixing to be on the road, move the crazies, and uh, sometimes he don't move them, and you have to be cautious around them. And then uh, you get there, and uh, then you get back home, and uh, you get in, and your wife's had a bad day, and you know, things didn't go real good for you, and you snap at her. That's not the thing to do. Take control. trying to see who's doing that maybe nobody here you know marriage is is something that when we do it right and we have a good relationship uh, and we pray together and we seek God about his will in everything that we're that we're doing uh, it's it's important that we pray about what we eat and what we think, and what's on our mind, and what we pick up on. Uh, when we walk in, it's possible that people can see that we are lacking on something. I've walked to the pulpit, and normally I, I look out at the people, and I try to visualize what's the state of mind they're in. Uh, sometimes this is what I do. I get to the church early uh, or during the day, and I, I start walking around the entire auditorium. And then when I feel something in this section, I, I walk around this section until I feel it by a certain pew. Then I walk up and down between that pew. And then after a while, the Lord says, sit down right here. And I say, God, Whoever's sitting here, if they got a problem, let me help them. If their marriage is sinking, God, let me say the right thing for them. And then when church starts, I look back to that exact place where I was sitting, and I realize, God, you guided me, first of all, in the entire circumference of the building, and then you related to me to walk around this section or this section and then I walk between the pews right where someone's going to be sitting that their marriage is not doing so good oh lord I, I think about Uncle Matt Holland you remember Uncle Matt uh, he come to our service one time when I was pastoring at Pine Grove his wife brought him and put him out, and then she went on back home. And so he comes skipping down the aisle, and I was already teaching my class, and boy, he comes skipping down the aisle, and then he go running back, and I stopped, and I was watching him. And then he uh, come running back up, and he just fell on his knees and skidded right to a pew and looked at those people sitting on that pew right on the end, uh, in the middle section, and he said, you better quit that fussing. And then he got up and started dancing around again. The thing had happened, they had had a major blowout that morning. They come on to church, and uh, boy, one of the ladies in the church, when, when she heard that, she, 
she wouldn't let this couple live that down. Uh, she'd get to church. She said, um, I think Uncle Matt's coming. If they thought he was going to come, they'd go get in their car and go back home because they didn't want God to show who they were that particular day. Marriage is something that uh, there will be disagreements. There will be inconsistencies. But we have to come to like here today to hear what to do. And, you know, we are in a place, you that are here, that's going to be talking to people uh, in classes or talking to them in a particular situation. And God can put in your mind exactly what to say to bring them to reality that, uh, no, 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 I'm not going to get in that situation again. I'm going to talk to the Lord, and me and the Lord's going to have a good little talk. And when it's all over, you, you will know. And you may not say anything. Oh, Lord, I've, I've, I've walked in the service before, Brother Sarton, and walked down the aisle, and all of a sudden I stop, and, and I say, are, are you all all right today? And they kind of look at each other, and, and then I, I realize, well, maybe, God, you did stop me. I said, when the opportunity is given, just go to the altar and lay it all on the altar, and God will take care of all the things that is not going so good for you. Finances is another thing that will happen. Uh, the Lord may come to your house, and he may look and see if he can find any good thing that's going on. But God forbid that he get to your house and doesn't find anything. Doesn't find, he can't feel a prayer uh, situation in the home and uh, things feels real bad. We need to be cautious in that area, in marriage, uh, in, in service to God, because the kingdom of God is, is very important and if, if we do right, you know, in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, it says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. To show how, to show, pardon me, you shall know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth uh, good fruit, uh, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. And not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we cast out devils? In thy name have we, have we done many wonderful works? And then... I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I don't want that to happen to me. And I don't want it to happen to anybody here. And then again, I asked, was he talking to you? Another occasion where the Lord uh, went to the people, and uh, he, the Bible says he walked through the vineyard, and he, he couldn't find the fruit. And so he, he told the uh, farmer of the vineyard, he says, uh, cut it down. They're not worth anything. And uh, the goodman of the vineyard, which in that case I would say was a pastor, pastor said, Lord, let, let me dig around them. Let, let me bring some fertilize in. Let me prune them up a little bit. And then 
uh, next year, if they don't produce any fruit, then you come back, but you will have to tell them that it's the end of the road because I, I, I can't do that. And that's the kind of man Brother Sarton is. Now, he wouldn't tell you that you're at the end of the road, but he would take the message, the word of God, and try to prune around you, dig around, uh, make sure that there's nothing attached to the tree because it didn't bring forth fruit. But he'll say, God, let me work with this person. Uh, I think if I can talk to them, uh, they can produce. And maybe their marriage will be better. Uh, it, my Lord, how many times have I had to do that? I've had to work with some, and uh, then they become a, a person that could be helped. And then I think of one thing before I close. Uh, I, I was, I was, I got through preaching and I walked down the aisle and uh, this lady, she stopped me about middle ways and she said, Brother Bourne, uh, could I critique your sermon? I said, well, absolutely. Did I say something wrong? She said, well, uh, if, if you let me critique your sermon, uh, I, I will tell you what you could do to make it better. I said, okay. And she started to talk. I said, whoa, whoa, ho hold on a minute. I said, there's someone coming down the aisle behind you. And I said, the Lord told me you slept with him last night. It's not your husband. And she said, I beg your pardon. I said, well, turn around and look at him. And then turn around and look me in the face and tell me you didn't do it. She turned, and when she turned back around, all the blood ran out of her face. I said, now, uh, if you want to continue on with your telling me what I've done wrong, that'll be okay. She said, no, sir. I said, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, the man come walking on by her and walked on out of the building. Uh, I said, now, no one will ever know I talked to you. I said, so I want you to, there's a room right back here. I want you to go in that room, and I want you to lock the door behind you, and I want you to pray till you have victory. So she went in that room, and uh, Sister Bourne and I stayed in that auditorium for two hours after every person had left. And finally, she came out after about two hours. I said, did you get victory? She said, yes. I said, so the next time I'm coming down the aisle, you know, I can look at you and tell if you hadn't got the victory. I said, now, I'll never tell your companion I'll never tell anybody that knows you. And then she become the best saint we had. She would walk in, and when I would meet her in the aisle, she would drop her head. I said, don't drop your head when you look at me. Look me straight in the eye. Because that eye contact, uh, I didn't have to say anything. She, she would she would automatically say, I'm in control. My Lord, it would have been a major disaster in the church had I revealed what we talked about that night. But God helped her, and no one ever knew. And to this day, I, I can ask my son, how is so-and-so doing? I say, They'll say, Dad, uh, they're one of the best saints we have. We don't have to worry about that one. I don't know what you said to her, but whatever you said really worked. And their marriage made it. It would have been the end of the line had I talked with a companion. And someone says, well, you should have. No, that was uh, privileged information. And God helped her. 
and salvaged her family. The boy walked out and never got his life straightened up because he wouldn't listen. So sometimes pastor comes to the stand and he preaches a message and he may not even know why he's preaching that message, but God laid a scripture on his mind and he preaches and it means that someone needs to watch where they're walking and watch what they're doing because tomorrow God may come along and find them. Uh, what was the scripture? He finds them swept and garnished and empty. We don't want to be empty when God comes into the church. We want to have enough in us that when we turn to walk away, we know everything's all right. I've, I've been gone now from Houston where I pastored for 18 years, 19 years now. But when I go there, I can walk in, and uh, when I see that lady, she will drop her head. I said, no, 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 no. God forgave you. You don't have to drop your head now. My Lord, isn't God good? But, you know, if, if God finds us swept and uh, empty, we need to have a little prayer meeting, just you and God. Fall down between the pew, fall here at one of these altars, and get everything right because living for God is the best thing that any of us could ever do. Living for God, if it's the best thing, then marriage is ordained by God. And when we do everything right, our families will make it. So here we are now, Sister Born and I, 62 years, and uh, we're happy. We don't have any problems that we know about. Uh, we are on the good side of, of uh, health. Uh, my wife has had pneumonia, but she's on the recovery side. And uh, I had uh, cancer, and it's gone for, you know. Uh, the last time I went in and I saw the doctor, he said, um, how do you feel? I said, well, I feel good. He said, well, we know the cancer's still there. And I said, no, 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 you don't know that. Uh, you don't know it because you couldn't even prove it by your million-dollar machine that you put me through. Uh, I said, so I'm doing good. And I can travel a 1,000 miles and preach and then get in the car and drive on to the next place 400 miles and get there and preach and and uh, I, I feel good. Matter of fact, uh, someone bought me this little stuffed animal. And uh, they said, Brother Bourne, you will like this. And so I've, I've mentioned this here one time before, but you touch his foot and he starts singing this song, I feel good. Do, 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 do. I feel good. You know, uh, I, I believe Reverend James Brown uh, takes up with that song. Uh, he didn't know I was going to make a gospel song out of that. But uh, when I get to feeling real good in a service, I make mention of the fact that James Brown wrote a good gospel song. And I, I take the part that I want to use, and it fits in real good. It's better than some songs I've heard preached or sing in church, um, even though they wasn't wrong, but I didn't understand them. I scratched my head. I said, what in the world's going on? And sometimes that happens in our marriage. We, we wonder, where, where did we fail? What happened that separated us? What, what, what's wrong right now? A little prayer. Maybe pastor anointing you and not even know why you're getting prayed for. It, it melts things out and puts you back together. And when you walk in, you can worship the Lord from the dictates of your heart and not worry. Someone said, well, Brother Warren, it's not necessarily for me to get all involved. Well, it is. Uh, well, I've been up here long enough. But my last remark here, 
do what's right. And if you're wrong, look at your companion and say, you know, I was wrong. And I want you to forgive me. And then turn to God and say, God, uh, I, I got my wife's forgiveness. Now I want yours. <laughs> and God will say, I'll forgive you. You're doing the right thing. Or it could be on the other side. But some don't think they have to ask any forgiveness. It's like one thing I said. This, this lady, she uh, asked her husband, says, do you still love me? He said, well, I told you that one time. That's enough. Well, it's not enough. <laughs> While marriage is the most important thing, it's good to hear it from your companion. Um, I like to hear my wife say, I love you. Well, for 62 years, it, that still sounds mighty good to me. And she likes to hear it. And so that's where we are today. Happy. Ready to go. Ready to preach. I told my wife, I said, you're going to have to preach in New Orleans this week. She said, okay, give me a sermon. She said, no, you know better than that. I said, well, yeah, I'm just picking at you. I'm glad that I'm here today. And I hope that I've said something to get you on your face, talking to the Lord. And if there was any, um, any wavering, get it straight today. Sometimes... Uh, I look at my wife and I said, I don't know if I've acted out of the way towards you, but I said, in case I have, uh, you got to forgive me. She said, well, I don't know of it. And I said, well, I hope you never know of it because I'm going to do right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give everything I can to God. Thank you, Brother Sarton, for allowing me to talk on this subject. May the Lord bless you.